Autism Canada depends on the generous support of viewers like you. If you find this presentation helpful, consider donating at autismcanada.org. Well, I'm so honored to be here speaking to you specifically because as parents of children on the spectrum of autism, you are seeing what most people will be seeing in about 20, 30 years. You're seeing your children having adverse brain responses to a world that's not designed to support brain function. Bottom line. So I'm hoping I can bring you to that awareness through some slides and through some, some common logic. So interesting for me, I started out broad and went nutrition and then fine-tuned down was learning from Sidney Baker, Martha Herbert, Jill James, all the, the autism experts. And I went, oh my gosh, this is brilliant. They figured out what's going on. They figured out why people are having all these diseases and disorders. It's in the gut, it's in the brain, it's everywhere. But the interesting thing is it's not limited to autism anymore. We're now starting to see the similar causes for all disease. So yeah, you want to initiate rheumatoid arthritis, start in the gut. You want to initiate chronic migraines, start in the gut. If you want to initiate MS, start in the gut. Once you irritate the gut, it goes to the brain, you have some problems. Prior to that, it goes to the entire immune system. So what we're going to look at is a broad picture today. I'm not going to just isolate autism, although I'm going to discuss autism quite a bit. We're going to look at life. And in essence, when we think about life, we have to remember we're the third rock from the sun. <laughs> and we have this sun that's beaming down on us at all given times, and it's providing energy. And that energy then is captured in the form of plants. It's trapped in the leaves, right? We take that UVB, UVA radiation, and we'll allow for the conversion of minerals from the soil, carbon backbones from the air, Water, it's H2O, and we'll turn it into carbohydrates. In that same process, we'll turn it into amino acids. We'll turn all that energy into phytochemicals, amazing plant compounds. It's this brilliant symphony of action that turns out to give us nature, in essence, life on this planet. We have these glacials that are dripping down water all the time and breaking down and giving us minerals and soil and giving us life-nourishing water. This is Bellingham, by the way, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And it, it then manifests in this life-giving substance called food. Blueberries in this particular case. And did you know that the mountain blueberries, when they're exposed to those adverse temperatures, more radiation because they're higher in the atmosphere, and they get bitten by the voles, and they get those frosts all the time, they produce more chemicals than your store-bought blueberries? Did you know that entire process of communication of stress turns up the ability of those plants to survive? And that resiliency, that exposure, will give you the nutrients you need to survive and thrive in a stressful environment. So, let's, let's say, okay, let's go back. So if that's the optimal, where are we at now? What's happening now? So Stephen Jenis wrote this article, he's from Alberta, and he says, look, what's making us sick? Because you know, the average doctor, you're coming into their office and they're saying, well, let me assess you, let's see. You've got irritable bowel. <laughs> Oh, how do I know that? Easy. Well, you came into my office and you said, Doctor, my bowels are irritated. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you nausea, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. Aha, excellent. Here's your script. Go on your way now. Wow, how helpful was that? You leave with something that's going to hopefully minimize some of the symptomology, but you still have the disease or disorder, correct? That's what's happening. So you leave and okay, you take that and, and within six months time, probably you're back in the doctor's office because you never solved the issue. So let's get to the irritants, let's get to the mechanisms, let's get to what's causing this dis-ease. And when you look at a conventional model, most people are looking at germs and genetics and psychological factors, but they're missing two key factors and those are nutrient deficiencies and toxic exposure. 
What have we seen since we've had a boom in the incidence of autism in the 80s? What have we seen? What's happened? Have the genetics changed? Maybe there's more germs. Maybe more people are stressed. Yes, but I can guarantee you the average person alive today is eating less nutrient-dense food. The average person alive today is exposed to tens of millions of pounds more toxins than anybody alive 25 years ago. So why aren't we looking there? Why aren't we saying all disease equals too much of stuff we don't like, thank you Sydney Baker, and too little of stuff we need? We're getting too many irritants, too many things holding us back, and not enough things supporting us, pushing us forward. Therefore, we are out of a state of ease. One has to just glance at this single article, and I'm sure this might have been shown to you already in this conference, I don't know. Pediatrics, 2011. This shocked me, shocked me. In that you look at the actual numbers and you say there are 27 trillion pounds of chemicals. 27 trillion pounds of chemicals coming into the United States every year. What does that equate to? 74 billion pounds of chemicals imported or produced in the United States every single day. Let's break that down. Let's recognize that this is not complete. There are no fuels, there's no pharmaceuticals, there's no food additives, and there's no pesticides included in that number. So you're well over 300 pounds of chemicals per person per day when you add everything in. How comfortable do you feel about that? The reality is that the companies that are running the globe right now are primarily chemical companies, whether they're biotechnological weapons companies, biotech firms who are making chemicals and biotech plants in the United States and abroad. The reality is our economy, our currency, our value currently on the globe is being rated in how big our house is, how large our car is, how much we're making it in life. And what I'm concerned about is the true currency, which we talked about in the first couple of slides. You will go bankrupt if you don't have air within three minutes. You will go bankrupt if you don't have water within three days and food within three weeks. So what is the true currency in life? Wouldn't it be clean air, clean food, clean water? Couldn't it be things like happiness, joy, love, connection? So the interesting piece is we're not paying attention to what value truly is and therefore we're manifesting what we think value is, which is a ton of chemicals. Tons and tons of chemicals. Now unfortunately, the government body in the United States and in Canada is slightly different, but we have something called the TSCA that's supposed to regulate chemical exposure. And this particular article said, this is so incredibly inadequate. In fact, it doesn't even touch what's happening in pregnant women and children. And it's saying we had to take a separate act of Congress just to amend this act to get asbestos off the marketplace. So over 80,000 plus chemicals are in the marketplace right now, just in the US alone. And out of those 80,000 chemicals, five, five have gone through the regulatory process to be pulled off the market because they've been considered dangerous. If you read this article closely, it shows that there are incentives for people that are chemical companies not to submit safety testing for their products. So, wow, we have a lot of chemicals. We're not quite sure what they do. And yet, anything that ends inside, what's that primary mechanism of action? Think about it for a second. What is an insecticide or an herbicide or a pesticide? What does it mean? <coughs> Death, killing. Oh, okay. So how do we feel about millions of pounds of that being spread all over the globe? Thankfully, this is from yesterday. There is a little bit of hope on the horizon. Perhaps they're going to start regulating some of the chemical companies. But in the meantime, we have to be conscious of the fact that when we are purchasing products that are either chemical-based or sprayed with chemicals, we're contributing to the distribution of these things on the globe. We know that there is a drift from sprays. So anytime somebody sprays something, some of these chemicals 
get off onto the surrounding land, they'll get into the water, they'll get into the food supply. Why would that be a concern specifically for us? Because this specific study showed us that if children are born and raised in areas that are within 500 meters of pesticide spray sites, they have a six times increased risk for autism. So that should tell you a few things. Number one, these aren't benign. Number two, they're specific to autism. So that's, that's fascinating to me because if pesticides are really so bad, it would be a bad thing if most people that were tested had pesticides in them. But this study showed us it's true. When you took three to 11 year old children and you checked to see if they had chlorpyrifos and malthion, two commonly used, still today, pesticides, they found them in all their blood. But the interesting thing was, when you got these children to go on an organic diet, the levels dropped down almost immediately. And when you put them back on a conventional diet, they jumped up almost immediately. So what does that tell us? That tells us the food supply is contaminated with these chemicals. And unless we're conscious to avoid them, we will get them. Now why is that a concern? I mean, chlorpyrifos was banned for home use. Did you know that? You can't go and use chlorpyrifos in your home as an insecticide because it's banned because it causes neurocognitive and behavioral disorders in children. But agricultural people, they can spray it as much as they want and it can get in your food supply. And we see that when you have levels of chlorpyrifos that are elevated, the IQ goes down on children. Okay, why am, I, why am I harping on this? Why am I getting... Organics matter, folks. Organics matter. And it's not just for you, it's for the person sitting next to you and your neighbor and the child who's living within 500 meters of an agricultural site where those chemicals are being used. So it makes a difference. Now, this, we had some technical problems, that's why we were so late here, and one of my other versions of this presentation had a few other slides here that negated a Stanford study that came out showing that organics don't make a difference, that they're nutritionally the same, and it basically said, <laughs> no way, are you kidding me? There's a tremendous increase of pesticide exposure when you consume conventional foods, and the nutrient status of the organics is higher. So, do you remember I talked to you about blueberries up in the mountains? What was it that caused the blueberries to have more miraculous chemicals? Stress. Stress. I equate conventional agriculture to like a hammock in Fiji. How much stress is there for a blueberry if it's hanging out in a hammock in Fiji? Now, if it's having to fight against moles and frosts and, and all sorts of UV radiation up in the mountains, it's under stress, it'll produce more chemicals. When you don't have to have that stress, the foods aren't as dense in those chemicals. So, if you've seen this Landergren uh, paper, you might want to look at this. It's basically tying in certain chemical exposures and neurocognitive and behavioral disorders in children. And they're trying to say, wow, guys, if you're ignoring this, you're missing the fact that we have a silent pandemic on this planet right now. We need to wake up and recognize that the chemicals themselves are one of the key factors that have shifted the development of our children over the last few decades. Rather than primary genetic in origin, expanding research continues to demonstrate that chronic illness is generally a consequence of various environmental factors. Now these environmental factors will change gene expression. Now let's imagine though you have a child on the spectrum. And let's imagine that the research is showing that they have certain genes that predispose them to tolerate these chemicals even less. Then you've got a recipe for disaster, right? Perhaps you've seen this article, industrial food environment. So we're looking at autism and I'm just going to focus on one little square here 
I know this is complicated, and I, you probably hate these diagrams after <laughs> one whole day of, of science, right? So the PON1 decreases and lead levels may increase with calcium loss. So what this is telling us is this peroxidase 1 that allows us to process some pesticides is usually challenged in the autism population. And they're usually malnourished. So we, what did we talk about? We talked about too many irritants. We talked about not enough nutrients. And there was a third factor. It was genetic predisposition, recipe for disease. So if you have an enzyme that doesn't work very well to push out pesticides, and you don't have enough nutrients like calcium that's a cofactor for that enzyme, what do you end up with? You end up with pesticides that stay in the system longer and cause more issue. Does that make sense? So we need to consider eating the organics for that reason and also for the global reason. It turns out that with the introduction of genetically modified foods in 1996, we've increased the use of our herbicide Roundup by 527 million pounds. So, and it's going up now because there's now resistant weeds. A lot of weeds aren't responding to Roundup, so they have to use more and more and more, and they're resistant. So they're actually going to start adding in 2,4-D and dicamba, two more herbicides. But anyway, the reality is there are a lot of papers coming out now that if you look closely, you'll see connections within the papers to the use of glyphosate or perhaps some of the side effects of the use of glyphosate. And the exact same symptoms we're seeing, glyphosate, I'm sorry, is the Roundup uh, active ingredient. We're seeing the exact same things that we're seeing in the autistic population. Changes bacterium, changes possibility of detoxification, changes aromatic amino acids, changes sulfation. So what are the same things we see in autism? Right here. Go down the line. They all seem to be connected to similar effects of the use of this specific herbicide called Roundup. There is a physicist out on Lummi Island who lives not too far from me who did the correlation coefficients to determine if perhaps there's any correlation between this increased use of glyphosate and autism. Look at this correlation coefficient you have here. It's a 0.985. In statistics, if you have a 1 and a 1, it's like, yeah, you're dead on. How much closer do we have to get to 1 to start paying attention? 0.985 is pretty close. So, all right, organics. We got it, Tom. Thank you. Um, how, how is this going to affect some of the labs I'm seeing, some of the nutrients I'm concerned about my child having? Who in this room is taking vitamin D right now? Okay. And you're giving it to your children, and you're, you're probably getting your tests over and over again, you know, the nadir of the season, the low point, maybe the high point, seeing where those levels are a couple of times a year. Yeah, it seems to be really important, right? John J. Cannell has really brought our awareness. Thank you, sir, for that. And did you know that there is a problem with vitamin D in the presence of certain chemicals? Did you know that the body will upregulate certain enzymes in the presence of certain chemicals, and it will turn vitamin D into an inactive form? So you have a chemical exposure, and you're not finding what that is, and you're taking vitamin D and you're saying, why aren't the levels going up? The literature's like really weird. I mean, you, you, I had these debates with some people on the radio, and they were like, oh, vitamin D is not really that important. I mean, even people in Hawaii who are surfers, they get exposed to, you know, to sun all the time, and their vitamin D levels don't climb, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, we're missing something, folks. You're missing the fact that the body adapts to everything it's exposed to. And when you have chemicals around, you will actually react by increasing an enzyme that inactivates vitamin D. I won't get into the big deep story on that, but let's just know this is well researched. Hollick brought this to our attention a while ago. I included those slides and, and hopefully they'll have those available to you. But look at this. Of 200 pesticides tested, 106 had activity for turning on that specific enzyme. So, huh, that could be a problem. What else might be a problem? Now, this is out of order from my original slides, unfortunately, but here we are. The 
other problem is, in today's day and age, when we're exposed to mercury, when we're exposed to pesticides, when we're exposed to chlorine in water, it affects us, right? But what else does it affect that's part of us? Who's hearing all the news about the microbiome? Does anybody know what that is? It's that miniature universe that lives within you and on you. I mean, there's really like quite a few, it's you know, 10 times the amount of actual organisms versus human cells, and over 100 times the amount of genes are expressed by those organisms versus by humans. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, who's in charge here? We as humans, plants, animals, any other inhabitants on this planet, learn to exist in the presence of bacteria. So we rely on bacterium for everything. And what we're seeing is the bacterium may be a key behind some of the imbalances in the autism population. Why is it so important? Well, it looks as though your immune cells are constantly searching the lining of the intestinal tract, your skin, constantly searching to see who's out there. And when you have certain species of organisms around, it sends a signal to your immune cells, everything's cool, don't worry about it, no big deal. If you're exposed to a food that looks kind of foreign, don't overreact. If you're exposed to a chemical, don't overreact. Take care of business, move on. And in fact, a lot of these organisms interact directly with chemicals. They help to metabolize things, it's phenomenal. So this is basically telling us, look, the seat of immune response in the human relies on positive interactions with microbes. This is where all the research is going, gang. We've now tracked it to insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, obesity, autoimmune diseases. It looks like the microbiome, the bacterium, are needing to be in balance. Why would this be a concern if we're getting sprayed, why would this be a concern? Let's go to this slide here. Because the average child is getting antibiotics at 10 to 20 rounds before the time they're 18. Because our drinking water has antimicrobial, I took a shower this morning in very chlorinated water, and it's antimicrobial, right? It's supposed to get rid of some of the bugs. The hand sanitizers, let me tell you a quick case study. Pediatric patient coming in, not even six months old, sent to me by uh, uh, a primary care physician and a dermatologist. And the child comes in, beautiful cherub cheeks, just incredible, right? And, um, but covered, like from head to toe. It's not even that cold outside, but covered in like, you know, mitts and, and a hoodie and like every I'm like, oh, gee, what's going on here? You know, mom, you all right? So she says, look, um, you know, I, I have to do this because my child will itch like crazy. And I'm like, oh, really? What's going on? So she pulls back the hoodie and oh, there's just this, all this scabbing and eczema like and bleeding. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, what is going on here? And so as she's doing this, the baby starts crying. And she goes, oh, hold on. Takes the hand sanitizer from her purse, <laughs> squirts it on her pinky, and before it's even dry, puts it in the infant's mouth. And, you know, to calm it down. And I'm thinking to myself, have we really gotten that far? Have we gotten so far from soil that we think that all bacterium is bad? Have we really gotten to a point in our sanitized society that we just can't have any sort of dirt whatsoever? Of course, we had a very long discussion about the hygiene theory and what the microbiome does. And uh, she was actually offended. I never saw her again. <laughs> so um, the question then becomes, could we be shifting our immunologic response and what's happening with our foods by changing our microbiome? And I provided some research to Jeffrey Smith, and he was looking at how GMO foods and the pesticides associated with GMO foods might be contributing to instability in the intestinal tract, and how that itself might be allowing for a more permeable gut. So by shifting some of the microbes in your intestinal tract, it shifts to types that may allow for your intestinal lining to open up. Why would that be a problem? 
what do you normally house in your gut, right? Trillions of organisms that you don't necessarily want in your bloodstream. What do you also house in your gut? Food particles, right? Food particles that hopefully are broken down first before they travel into your bloodstream. What happens when you have a large food particle that travels into your bloodstream and it's not broken down properly? Your immune cells go, what is this? Oh my gosh, look at that uh, amino acid fragment piece. It looks an awful lot like the thyroid gland. Maybe I'll launch an attack against this piece and then I'll also launch an attack against the thyroid gland. Or let's go ahead and launch an attack against this piece and every time I see that, I'm going to have this inflammatory response. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, and desserts, someone has an inflammatory response. To what? What are the primary food sensitivities we're seeing in clinical practice? High protein, non-digested food particles. Dairy, wheat, right, soy eggs. So the, the more we irritate the gut, cause permeability, the more we allow those food particles to come in, the less our children are able to tolerate. You don't need to know these specific strains of bacterium that we're finding out of balance. But guess what causes leaky gut, folks? The articles that are coming out right now about foods and leaky gut, my gosh, right? We're seeing that this specific article was looking at NF-kappa B being increased as someone was consuming sausage muffins and hash browns for breakfast. And it's funny because all the articles are saying, well, what's, it's the high fat content. The high fat content causes the leaky gut. But guess what? I'm here to tell you that it's the chemicals in the food and how the foods shift your microbiome. Because it turns out that if you give animal fats to rats, you can cause inflammatory issues. You give them vegetable fats, they don't have as many issues. Why is that? We're going to talk about chemical accumulation in just a second. But look at that. You can, versus a regular water, drink of water, the increase of inflammatory gene expression after a meal like that is through the roof. So finally, half an hour into it, he's getting into food. Yes, I am. Who hasn't seen this? This is the Autism Research Institute Parent Questionnaire. 27,000 parents of autistic children asked, what therapies work best? Is it medication? Is it supplementation? Is it dietary alteration? The results from this study show, one, IVIG medication has a decent response. But the astronomical benefits come from food allergy treatment, candida diet, gluten-free diet, low oxalate diet, removing chocolate, removing eggs. It's all diet-based, folks. Now, why is this a concern? Because there is a disconnect. There are people like myself who are clinicians who listen for over an hour who gather as much dietary intake information as possible, that ask people to journal and see what differences happen when certain foods are introduced, who put people on gluten-free, casein-free diets and other elimination type diets for an extended period of time, listen, watch, and learn. And we've known for over a decade that dietary intervention is the most powerful thing you can do, not just for autism, but for many disorders. And then there are researchers who say, we've heard gluten-free, casein-free diets may work. Let's analyze these. And I can guarantee you they're getting cross-contamination of gluten into the food supply of the people who are on the test. They are not following up with the people to making sure that there's some sort of compliance necessary. They're not all in-house studies, unfortunately. And I know, as a clinician, because 99.9% .9 of my people, if not 100, who I put on a gluten elimination diet and I asked them, can you fill out this intake form? Can you show me the label of that particular product? Can you blah, 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 blah. If I do the investigative work, I find hidden sources. No one's really succeeding. So if you succeed, can you make change? Yeah, absolutely. Come on, talk to any nutritionist or dietitian who's working in this space. If they've run hundreds of people, if not thousands, through these diets, and they've done it correctly, they will say, this is amazing what can happen. Nonverbal to verbal, no eye contact, eye contact, stemming gone, 
I mean, so many different things can happen. And yet, boom, doesn't help if you read literature, right? So there's a disconnect. Now, here's the problem. Once you alter the gut, you alter absorption, so the nutrients can't make it in. You alter inflammation. You're turning on the immune cells five, seven times a day. At the same time, you have to think, holy smokes, this is an immune response much like a bacterium or a virus. How much does it take if you're sitting in an airplane, someone five rows back from you, coughing, sneezing, how much does it take? How much exposure do you need before you're going to get the flu? Do they have to serve it up in a cupcake? Or is it teeny fragments that get in the air? So the problem is the cross-contamination, the exposure when you're eating out. The 100% effort equals 100% result rule is king here. I talked to Alicia Fasano, the world expert on gluten sensitivity and celiac disease, and I said, look, I've been finding this, you know, and I wanted to confirm, does it really have to be 100%? Because come on, you know, the kids want to go to the birthday party, and they want to do the cookie, and then they go to grandma's house, and grandma has to feed them that cake, and look, 100% effort equals 100% result. He said 99% effort equals zero results. That's what he said. I don't find that to be true. I see people get a little bit better, but if you want to see that shift, if you want to turn off that inflammatory response, you want to change that immune system, get it all out and watch what happens. So is it necessary if you're concerned about celiac disease or food, uh, uh, you know, gluten sensitivity and you want to determine you have one or the other? It's great. You don't have to get a biopsy anymore. I think biopsies are incredibly invasive for children and I think they also give a, a huge exposure to some chemicals that maybe they don't want. So there's a new, I had to include this study for you that you'll get in your, your PDF notes. This is a new study that says you can do a blood test. You don't have to do biopsies anymore. I want to bring to your awareness that there are a lot of physicians, a lot of doctors out there, especially in our space, who will argue that there is nothing here. They will say it is celiac disease or it is nothing. And 1% of the population has celiac disease, so you guys are barking up the wrong tree. This is nonsense. And I want to say, get busy, doctors. You've got a lot of reading to do. Because the information's out there. It's been out there. This is a fascinating article that shows, look, people who are presenting with IBS to a standard clinic, they'll test them for celiac disease, they don't got it. They put them on an elimination diet challenge, turns out 30 plus percent of them have non-celiac wheat sensitivity. Non-celiac wheat sensitivity. There is an entire entity called gluten sensitivity that exists in the literature now. So be conscious of that if your doctor is giving you a hard time. Now, 75% of the people who end up testing positive for this wheat sensitivity also have a dairy sensitivity. Now look at this. 58% had eggs, 54% had tomato. How many people are doing elimination diets? How many people are start, you know, starting to recognize that food is information? It can either be a positive conversation with your intestinal tract, or it could be a shouting match all the time. We want to have calm communication in the intestines. It equates out to less disease. Overall symptoms of people with these wheat sensitivities, bloating, abdominal pain, stool consistency problems. They went down when they went on this elimination diet. And what did they have to do, folks? You know what they had to get rid of? Oh, shoot, this is a, the recovery one gave me the wrong presentation. Um, basically, they got rid of all grains, except for rice. All grains. Because the likelihood of you getting millet, buckwheat, sorghum, Cross-contamination is quite high. So when they got rid of those pre-fab mixed flours and whatever, they got better. Okay. So here it is. Plain, unfavored brown and white rice, fruits and vegetables, meats. They gave eggs and butter and whatnot, but I'll tell you, in our particular population, when we remove the dairy specifically, and sometimes eggs in some children, then boom, the symptoms get better. Here's the data to show you. The research is replete with cross-contamination awareness. The scientists know 
that when you're buying gluten-free products, it's possible for you to be getting cross-contamination. Oats aren't always safe. Many of the oats have cross-contamination issues. Always look for certified gluten-free, and some of the children still don't respond well to that. Here's the issue. Lack of adherence to a strict gluten-free diet is not intentional in many cases. Many people think they're doing exactly what they need to be doing, and yet they're getting exposure still. Here's one of the most amazing cases. This is New England Journal of Medicine, folks. So when your doctor says, this is nonsensical <coughs> nonsense, I was going to say something else. So when it's, when it's not something they're aware of, because you know doctors, right? They're down on what they're not up on. I was in medical school, seven years. I've come across everything. I had clinical training. You should have seen my supervisors. They were brilliant. They know everything. If you're telling me something that didn't exist in that reality space for me, my learning continuum, then it doesn't exist because I learned everything. God, wouldn't that be nice? So um, New England Journal of Medicine says, wait a second. We had two people. We put them on these strict gluten elimination diets. They were celiacs. And we followed them around. And we said, wait a second. They're still having responses. And they're meticulous in their diet. Meticulous. We can't find any cross-contamination sources. We can't find anything. What is it? They finally recognized that both people, sometime throughout their workday, went into an enclosed room, poured animal feed into a trough, and the dust from the animal feed was inhaled by them, and they had full-blown gluten-associated reactions. What? See, this is a conventional medical journal. I think they need to stay up later when they're reading. I'm usually up to 1, 2 o'clock. So the issue is the fatigue, bloating, lower abdominal cramps went away in patient one. Abdominal cramps, daily diarrhea, fatigue, weight loss in patient two by just putting on a dust mask. Okay, let me show you what would be something your children would come in contact with. Kitchen. Dad, mom, brother, sister. Big bowl. Wheat flour. Pancakes. So great that we're serving gluten-free over here. But Dad, are you kidding me? He's got to have those pancakes. All right? Sun shining through the window. Dust particles. Settling on everything. I've had clients, a world-renowned artist and a world-renowned architect that are married to each other. The architect went a half a block from his wife and built another house so you could have a gluten-free kitchen. <laughs> now, there aren't that many people who have those kind of resources, but that shows you that this isn't crazy. This is real for a lot of people. So this is what the research shows you. The research shows you that the standard 0.4% population wheat allergy, 1% approximate celiac disease, 6% gluten sensitivity, Notice that's six times higher than celiac disease, but a lot of doctors don't recognize that. Tell them to go back to the literature. It's changed since whenever they went to medical school. So here, this is kind of a shocking image, but I want you to um, kind of get a, a frame. We are, we are humans, and we are what's called mammals, right? So our primary existence revolves around us Participating in sucking on the mammary glands of our mothers. Okay, that's what a mammal means, right? So <laughs> I had a teenager when my wife was breastfeeding in public at a, uh, a mall once. You start mouthing off to her friend that, that uh, you know, this was so inappropriate. And, well, I can't believe she's doing that in public. So I just said, excuse me, do you know what a mammal is? <laughs> she's like, what? And I gave her that definition. But um, this, is, this is not what's a custom for us. Okay? <laughs> this indeed is a mammal, and that's another mammal. But can you see that it's a different species? I mean, is that obvious in this photo? So um, the, the reality is we're the only species to partake in the milk of another species, and especially after weaning. So the question that becomes by a lot of people, all right, how in the world did that happen? Um, 
And why is that a problem? Because the dairy industry, since way back when, when I was in school, was giving us the four food groups, and I'd turn over the information and it said, sponsored by the Dairy Council. So all of that information about calcium, protein, strong bones, growth, whatever it is about dairy, um, yeah, okay, maybe, uh, maybe not. What I'm concerned about is if we're designed to be having breast milk and we're having the breast milk of a different species, are there proteins that are similar enough to confuse our immune cells? That's what I'm concerned about. Because if you look in the literature and you know because you've been a practitioner seeing pediatric patients, the majority of kids, especially in infancy, before the age of six months, don't tolerate cow's milk or cow's milk formula. There's going to be eczema, there's going to be bowel problems, oftentimes there's bloody stools. It's known as cow's milk protein sensitivity or intolerance. It's all over the medical literature. Any pediatric physician who is not conscious of that is not conscious. So if we know that those proteins cause irritation in young children up until the age of three, usually they'll fully outgrow it by the age of three, how do we then assume that that immune response hasn't changed slightly or that it's even beneficial at all? I don't know. But I would say that when you start diving into literature, you'll see that rheumatoid arthritis, now we're seeing with cow's milk uh, in association, we're seeing infant formula when it has more of the casein protein in it and it's not bro broken down adequately, um, more children have a negative response to it. We're seeing that People are clearly tying in the consumption of cow's milk as a cause of iron deficiency in infants and toddlers. And we see from Dan Brosignol from the Autism Research Institute in MAPS um, that in his severe clients, he was showing at about 75.3%, well, he got the wrong slide on this one, 75.3% of his, his clients with his severe autism had a folate receptor autoantibody response, and he attributes it to dairy intake. So the dairy proteins look similar enough, you cause an autoantibody response, you tear down this folate receptor, then the children do not get enough folate. You supplement high doses of folinic acid, they get better, you take out the dairy, they get better. So this is kind of like, you know, hmm, all right. So why is it any wonder for any physician out there, any nutritionist out there, that elimination type diets removing gluten and dairy might not be beneficial? ADD, ADHD, the interesting thing is yes, across the board you see people getting better. The interesting thing if you look closely, the parents who also follow the diet with the children oftentimes find joint pain, fatigue, energy issues getting better. When you start taking out some of the nonsensical chemicals that are added into the food supply to benefit mouthfeel, preservation of the food, to benefit eye, eye stimulation. Walk through a candy aisle sometime, you'll get some eye stimulation. When you remove those things, we're seeing the fine gold, uh, fine gold diet is extremely effective for children. And it doesn't just include the foods, it's also the products that they're associated with. So, the toothpaste, the soaps, whatever, where their colors, food dyes. And I don't know if you're familiar with removing scents. I don't know if we'll get down to it. Probably not. I'm running out of time. But scent, anything that says fragrance, anything that says parfum, has a stabilizing agent in it normally called a phthalate. Oil and water don't mix. You have to put something in between the two to make a mix. You guys fam familiar with phthalates? P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-S? Yeah. So there's a, a now an association we're seeing between um, development of children and phthalates and uh, specifically with autism. So watch out for dryer sheets. Watch out for plastic covers on pillows and beds. It's used as a primary plasticizing agent along with things like BPA. So phthalate, phthalate, phthalate. Um, they'll, they'll recommend you get rid of scented items on the fine gold product. But coloring, food coloring, I love these popsicles, gray and white popsicles. Yum. These, um, see, the eye candy, right? I mean, it takes so much to sell a kid. Try and get a kid to eat like black cooked broccoli. It just doesn't work. Try and get them to eat regular broccoli. So, um, you know, you take these food colors out, you see the behavioral problems go away, right? We also see intestinal issues that they don't mention here, but this is all behavioral, hyperactive behavior goes. 
What else do we see in foods? And we see with chemicals in foods, we're seeing meats, right? You see the, the seafood? Here's a nice little list for you of the least, least mercury-containing foods that you have there. This particular chart will show you even better, right? That's from Wikipedia, so you can grab that if you want it. But uh, it's nice, you can put it up in your fridge, right, when you're going fish shopping. Um, what we're concerned about with chemical levels, specifically in foods, so you want to give your kid nutrition, but you want to give them the anti-nutrition, lots of good, less irritant, is you're finding it in the skins and livers, animal fat, farmed salmon, canned foods, GMO foods, because they're sprayed with the herbicides. Usually they're multiple times higher than other uh, produce. Cotton seed oils, dirty dozen fruits and vegetables, you know this one, and conventional chocolate. Folks, we have to put on the radar what, what, the farm salmon. So, so many people are hearing essential fatty acids are phenomenal, go out and eat salmon. How many people actually find wild elastic? You, come on, where are we? <laughs> if you're not getting wild Alaskan or wild Canadian salmon, you're missing the boat, literally. <laughs> So the consumption is through the roof now. This is just to show you that between 1950 and 2012, there's actually more farmed salmon being consumed than beef. And it depends on your economic strata. And we see that, yep, okay, you've got all the adults starting to eat all these farmed salmon, but did you know that they fatten up the salmon with fish oils that are laden with PCBs? And um, that gives them 52% more fat but then it also gives them astronomical amounts of the PCBs. Farm catfish and farm salmon are the highest. Come on, that's like sacrilegious. We have the most amazing salmon here. Of course, you know, they want to introduce aqua bounty salmon, right? That's a genetically modified salmon. They're gonna keep them just in farms, but they already did estimates that if a single generation escapes, they could actually breed with native either salmon and or brown trout and create a super fish that within 50 generations we would no longer have fish. So, um, phew, what a downer. Let's get on some good stuff, Dom. So, uh, thankfully, there's studies on plants that are saying us, you know, that the phytochemicals within plants change gene expression. We know that when you're consuming these vibrant colors from nature, not from popsicles, that you get these amazing plant-based chemicals that can change gene expression. So when you're on the right side, rich in, in antioxidants, then you, you get a ton of goodness all over the place. You can have these phenomenal meals that are gluten-free, dairy-free. Shoot, these are everything but wild Alaskan salmon-free. And we've got a, you know, a cashew dressing on the top salad with apples. Um, you can get snacks that children love to enjoy. Nourishingmeals.com is our blog. We give away free recipes all the time. They're always gluten-free. Always gluten-free, casein-free. Many of them are egg-free. We're doing more egg recipes now because we have a lot of SCD folks and whatnot. Um, so the, the ability to pack in the opposite exists. If you can have total degradation by exposure of chemicals, you can have complete rebuilding with association with positive foods. There is a pendulum and it can swing both ways and we're gonna swing one way. You can have pizzas with cashew-based cheese and pesto sauce and these uh, crusts that are not having any sort of gluten at all. You can pack a blender full of vegetables. And here's the tip, folks. If you have a child who's not accustomed to consuming greens, but they like smoothies or they like popsicles, you can chock a block full all the yummy fruits that they like, and then slowly, okay, sorry kids, slowly sneak in a collard green leaf or a piece of black kale. Blend it up, they'll never know. Each week, increase by another leaf. Each week, another leaf, another leaf. Next thing you know, the weird thing is, the kids will tolerate it. It just has to be a sneaky dose response relationship. If you've got one of those kids, <laughs> technical. If you've got one of those kids who's hypersensitive to lots of flavors and textures, check out the zinc levels. Look at the zinc supplementation. That may help. Granted, when it comes to cruciferous vegetables, any of those vegetables that have a sulfury flavor to them, Less than 5% of the population will have hyper bitter sensitivity. They won't tolerate them. 
So good luck trying to sneak those in. But I'll show you a secret here in just a little bit. You can also get some of the fruits into desserts. You don't have to be using agave nectar. You could be using coconut sugar, all sorts of fun stuff. Now, one thing to be conscious of when you start introducing more fruits and vegetables to your children's diets is watch for gooey poops. What does that mean? Well, exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> In essence, what happens is they get kind of sticky and not quite loose, but not totally solid. And this may be a sign that the child is having a fructose intolerance. Up to a third of the general population who has irritable bowel has a fructose intolerance. There are five specific foods that I find in my clinical practice that when I remove them from people who have these fructose intolerances, they get better. Apples, pears, cherries, high fructose corn syrup, and agave nectar. So that's something to be conscious of. You start adding in fruits, things get worse. Huh, interesting. Start adding in vegetables and fruits and things get worse. Perhaps you've heard of phenol sensitivity, salicylate sensitivity, perhaps you've not. The reality, folks, is the more chemicals we get exposed to, the more we have to use sulfur to metabolize them. If we don't have adequate sulfur, we can't necessarily metabolize some of the natural compounds. The more our gut gets out of balance, the more we can't rely on it for metabolism as well. In balanced gut, lots of toxic exposure, more and more children, more and more adults are reacting to salicylates, amines, phenols that need to be metabolized with these certain ingredients that normally are totally fine. So if you see things like this list here, emotional extreme, I, you know what, the slap happy is a great definition. Kids that just get like off the hook, they laugh at everything. You watch the pupils, I see that too, but they, they're just like ah, running around just destroying stuff. You're like, what in the world is going on with that kid? You may want to consider that they need additional sulfur, magnesium sulfate baths called Epsom salt baths seem to be incredibly helpful. Also, the sulfur containing supplements, the alpha lipoic acid, the N acetylcysteine, the taurine, the sulfur containing substances seem to assist as well. If you're already doing glutathione, kudos on you, that's fantastic. But here's interesting. Sulfation in low-functioning autistic kids, we see that there's definite association between sulfation and autism. And then we also see that in a group of kids who had salicylate intolerances, it gave them 10 grams of fish oil a day. 10 grams. And by giving them 10 grams of fish oil, they were able to get rid of that salicylate sensitivity. They did slightly less, they didn't get the same effect. That's a lot of fish oil. Krill oil seems to work really well too, but you need lower doses of the krill oil. Who's been playing around with krill oil? Yeah, do you guys see that? It seems like there's more of a central nervous response in some, uh, at least in, in some of the initial animal studies. So you can change. You can change so much by changing your food. You can balance out some of the microbes because what is food? It's food for you and it's food for your microbiome. What you don't get, they're going to get. So if you're feeding good foods, you're going to shift low bush variety blueberry shifts some of the beneficial varieties of bacterium in the intestinal tract. Broccoli has a tendency to do the same thing. And you can add in some of the beneficial microbes themselves in your own kitchen. Lacto-fermented vegetables. How easy are these? We have the kids just go out and chop up the stuff we pick from the garden, throw it in a jar, a couple tablespoons of salt, put a little thing of cabbage on the top, screw on the lid, and wait a week. At the end, there's probiotics, ad nauseum. And there's my phone. Not so ad nauseum. Yep. So, um, you know, if you have a child who doesn't tolerate broccoli, great. Go for the green beans. They don't like green beans, great. Go for carrots. They don't like carrots, great. Go for cauliflower. You get the idea. It's not really restrictive. You can put any vegetable in there and let them ferment. Now, I stressed you out, but I want to tell you, don't panic. Just eat organic and lots of broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, and Brussels sprouts. Why do I say that? Well, I did a presentation 
I did a presentation for the Autism Research Institute Scientific Roundtable. Actually, I think I drove them nuts because they originally I was going to speak about zinc and B6 and all sorts of stuff. And the night before my presentation, after listening to all these incredible scientific minds speaking, I went, oh, no one's talking about food. No one's talking about food. Like, they're talking about increasing glutathione, they're talking about sulfation, they're talking about all these detoxification pathways, and no one's talking about food. So I called up the director, like, I don't know, it was like midnight or something, I'm changing my presentation. She's like, are you kidding me? You can't do that. And I'm like, I have to, I have to. No one's talking about food. So I use this presentation. A lot of Sid Baker's work revolves around increasing the antioxidant glutathione dead center, right? Watch out for toxic exposure, change the microbiome. So what's the one food that can do this? What's the one thing that kind of turns on the genetics? And you guys aren't familiar with all these genes, but there's a, there's a secret gene hanging out inside your cells, right? And it, it's actually a transcriptive factor that can go read your genes. This gene is called the antioxidant response element portion. And it pops open hundreds of little proteins that come off of it. And there are certain foods that you can turn them on. So we know we know we all want this glutathione. We talk about the methylation pathway and how our autistic kids, they're interfered in multiple different spots and we have to be able to get them all the way down to get that glutathione. Well, what if you could consume some foods that ramp up every single cell's ability to produce glutathione? Wouldn't that be sweet? It would save you hundreds on that liposomal glutathione. But here we are with the Benny Brussels sprout, our own superhero right here. This is my garden. And you know how I got turned on to this stuff, folks? is I started reading about, you know, what shifts all of these things. And I, I started having some of the moms come out by the river with me. And I had this office by the river, and it had all of this weed growing by it. It's this right here, cardamine flexuosa. And this weed's growing everywhere. And they go down, and I would start picking up the weed and saying, hey, mom, mm -mm, this is delicious, mm -mm, right? And then inevitably mom would go down, and inevitably the young boy, or, or sometimes we have girls that come and they start consuming it. I'll say, Nate, for the next few weeks, just go take a lot of walks in the park that has this particular weed, and I want you to do what we're doing right now. So we did this, and guess what happens? It turns out that some of the glutathione markers will go up. You're like, what? It's a weed. Yeah, it's bitter cress. It has a sulfury, kind of spicy flavor to it. And that is usually indicative of a specific chemical that does a brilliant job of ramping up the phase two detoxification enzymes. Food is information, it talks to your genes. This particular food talks to hundreds of genes that increase detoxification and antioxidant function. And it's this entire family here, these sulfur smelling things, collards, turnips, broccoli, actually take turnips out, um, Brussels sprouts, arugula, kale, kohlrabi, daikon radish, phenomenal. You start eating these things and here's what happens. You get a chemical from them that's sulfur based, it comes into your cell, binds to a little spot, separates this transcriptive factor, goes into the nucleus of the cell, binds to this antioxidant response element and starts producing hundreds of proteins. It's amazing. It's not like regular antioxidants. You're going into every single cell and turning on the ability to produce more antioxidants. I kind of liken it to like the bat signal, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like Gotham City, right? We've got all the Joker and the Riddler and Catwoman. It's like all these pesticides and phthalates and everything is all over the place. And it's like, you know, someone call Commissioner Gordon. Like, let's get on the bat phone right now. And then, you know, you put up that bat signal and then all of a sudden it migrates into the nucleus and then pow, pow ka -ching, ka -ching, right? Everything's like back to normal. <laughs> so you have at the center is this glutathione and it looks like every one of these enzymes surrounding to keep glutathione around is increased in the presence of this sulforaphane. You can see the chart over here. So you come back and you say, how is this even possible? I mean, not only does it ramp up these enzymes, but at the same time, it preserves all of your natural antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A. It's like almost too good to be true. And it comes from your dinner and your lunch and your salad. And we see that once you do this, you know, it's replete, cancer rates go down. You have more antioxidant effects from broccoli sprouts than you do from blueberries, green tea, orange juice, because it lasts for 72 plus hours up to actually 94 hours. And you say, oh man, well, that's great. I'm going to go out and start eating a lot of weeds. <laughs> and I say, go for it. But make sure you don't cook them.
Because if you microwave them, if you overcook them, you boil, you broil them, you're actually going to kill some of the enzymes that allow for this chemical to be formed in your body. So if you do give cooked or frozen vegetables to a child and you want to get the level of these enzymes up, so let's say you had frozen broccoli that's been sitting in the fridge for a year, I can guarantee you that um, it's not going to be activated unless you take a little bit of raw cruciferous vegetable with it. A little bit of ground up cauliflower, a little bit of ground up kale, put a, you know, grind it up and put it as a spread on, on top of whatever the dish is, and you will actually go back and reactivate the ability of some of these chemical compounds. In fact, the radish daikon is incredible at doing this. So if you have some overly cooked stuff or whatever, daikon can help save you. But here, you know, you know, the green smoothies, they rule in our house. If you can introduce them to kids early enough, then they will love them throughout their lifetime. Sneak them in to the soups, the stews, the foods. Even if it's going to be a little bit cooked, I'd rather you had it than not cooked at all. There's an actual research paper showing that, yes, you still get some of the benefits even though you broil and overcook uh, Brussels sprouts. Here's my secret tip for you folks. Nourishingmeals.com. Go to our cashew ranch dressing recipe. Cashew ranch dressing. And here's what I'll do is I'll take a SGS, a broccoli capsule for kids who cannot tolerate any of the sulfury smell or taste or whatever. I'll take that capsule and I'll break it up. It's a concentrate of like two pounds worth of broccoli. Mix it into this specific dressing. And then I'll have the kids, I'll chop up either kohlrabi, the base of broccoli, or daikon. If it's not too spicy of a daikon, test it first because it can be really spicy. And you can have the kids use them as chips to dip it in there. But if they won't do that, then just spread the dressing over overcooked broccoli or whatever you can. Cauliflower, it doesn't matter. Spread the dressing over it, and the dressing has in it some of the broccoli constituents. So you take a capsule to broccoli sprout extract, or broccoli seed extract, excuse me, pop it in there, whip it up, it's good to go. So not only are we going to protect the outside, or the inside of our kids, but we can actually protect the outside with broccoli too. They're coming out now with sulforaphane lotions. These poor rats were subjected to like lots of UV radiation, and then they followed that UVA, uh, UV radiation with the application of sulforaphane-rich lotion, and it preserved the rats from getting skin cancer. Isn't that wild? They're mice, actually, in this case. They're nude mice. That was embarrassing for them. I'm glad I didn't put that up. So, um, one additional thing I want to say is by the consuming of both sulforaphane and curcuminoids, we can protect the effects of malathion. This is a toxicity study, so yeah, we can ramp up enough that we get tons of good things. Vital vegetables and fruits, look at a Vitamix, folks. If you don't have a Vitamix or a Blendtec or some sort of blender, if you want to sneak in some of these, two minutes, I'm going to rush. Go to town. You'll love it. Super good. Watch out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> you'd like that better than the other stuff, don't you? <laughs> I, I want to give one quick warning, warning and, and that is acetaminophen. When your children get inflamed, don't give them Tylenol. There's a, um, a real nice paper Dr. Shaw did on acetaminophen and how um, genetically vulnerable kids can have a real adverse response to that. And if you need an a, a alternative to the acetaminophen, there is, um, they've been looking at curcuminoid byproducts. So you can have curcuminoid uh, turmeric, turmeric extract products that you can give at high dose, and they're having similar effects to acetaminophen. Here's a specific comparative study right here. The dose has to be relatively high. This was a uh, analgesic mariva, nimulcide, and acetaminophen. So they did a comparison of the curcuminoid product, an opioid product, and an acetaminophen for reducing pain. And they found that the actual um, curcuminoid product was similar at high dose. Now, why is that a concern? Because there are so many negative reactions associated with the opioid type medication, non-steroid anti-inflammatories like aspirin and acetaminophen use. So that's nice to know. You know what else has the curcuminoids in it? It's called curry, yeah, with a little bit of coconut milk. Helps absorption, so phenomenal. Well, I better stop here, otherwise I could keep going.
Thanks.